Hey guys, Miss Marie Sick here, and in this video we're going to be talking about the collection of gas over water, which is a lab application of Dalton's Law. The way that it works is that we would have some sort of an experiment where we would be producing gas from a reaction, and we would want to collect that gas in order to make some measurements about it so we could figure out exactly how much gas is being produced by that reaction. So to do that, we would have a stopper in our reaction with some gas tubing coming out of it. And then we would run this into a large container of water where we had a smaller inverted container of water over it. Um, this inverted container more than likely would be a graduated cylinder and so that way we would have some millimeter markings on there so we could actually record our volume. And what we would do is we would allow that gas to collect in the container. So to see this in action I've recorded an animation clip to kind of show you how this would look. All right, in this animation here, what we have is a sample of potassium chlorate that when exposed to heat will decompose into both potassium chloride solid as well as into oxygen gas. And our goal is gonna to be to collect that oxygen gas in the setup that we see. So the tubing that you see coming from the reaction is run into a container of water and into an inverted graduated cylinder that currently is filled completely with water. Now this reaction does need some activation energy to get going. So as we start to heat the sample, what will happen is slowly but surely that oxygen gas will start to produce. And as it does so, it'll run through the tubing that we see into the container of water and into the inverted graduated cylinder where it will start to collect in that container. Um, as it does so, the water level will be pressed down as water displacement starts to occur. And so I could actually record the volume of gas that's being collected in that graduated cylinder. However, where we have to be careful is with the pressure value that we're recording. Technically, I'm not only collecting oxygen gas there, but I'm also collecting a little bit of water vapor. So to see that on a more molecular level here, um, what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in on that sample of gas that we're collecting. And what you'll be able to see is that while mostly there's oxygen gas there, the gas that was being produced, we also have a small amount of water vapor. And so when we're addressing the pressure in that container, the total pressure would be both the pressure of the oxygen that we made, but also a little bit of water vapor. So if I want to do a calculation with just the pressure of the gas that I'm recording, the pressure of the gas that I want, I'm going to have to look up the water vapor value on a table and subtract that from the total pressure of the gas. That would be the only way that I could get just the pressure of the oxygen by itself. All right, now that we've seen that animation, hopefully we understand the fact that I'm not only going to have the gas that I'm looking for here, but I'm also going to be collecting a little bit of water vapor, just because that water is going to naturally be evaporating somewhat. Now, we would be either presented with some sort of table that would have what the water vapor pressure is at a particular temperature, or they would just give us that value in our problem itself. And one other thing we would need to do in order to finish up this problem, which was not addressed in the animation, is that we would need to figure out what the total pressure was in that container so we knew what to subtract the water vapor from. So to be able to do that, what we would need to do is to take our collection tube and move it up and down until the water level is equal in both the collection tube as well as in the large container of water. Once those two water levels are equal, what we can assume is that the total pressure in this container is equal to the pressure of the atmosphere, which obviously we could get based off of what elevation we're at. We could look at a barometer even to measure that. Most of the time we assume we're at sea level and so that our pressure of the atmosphere would be 760 millimeters of mercury. But we could always measure the atmospheric pressure. It's a lot easier to measure that than the pressure that's inside of this collection tube. So once we have that pressure that's inside, we can then subtract off the water vapor pressure and get just the pressure of the gas by itself to then do some other calculations with it. Now one thing I do want to notate here is that this method only works for nonpolar gases. If you have a 
polar gas, the problem is, is that it will dissolve in the water itself. And so you won't be collecting as much of that gas as you really have been producing. And so it's gonna give you data that's very off from what it really should be. Um, one of the other pieces of data we can get is that the temperature of the gas is assumed to be the temperature of the room. And so if you think about all those pieces of data we have now, we have the temperature of the room, we'll have the pressure of the gas once we do our subtraction. If we used an inverted graduated cylinder here, we would have our volume. And so once we have the temperature, pressure, and volume, you could use Pivnert to calculate the number of moles that would be then collected. All right, so let's look at some problems that would be addressing the collection over water. First off on this question, it says, would it be better to use NH3 or CH4 to collect via water displacement and justify your answer. And this is where, again, it depends on if that gas is polar or nonpolar. Ammonia gas has a Lewis dot structure that looks like this, whereas CH4 is all carbons and hydrogens, and as we know, that tends to be nonpolar whereas our ammonia over here was polar. So the better one to collect via water displacement would definitely be the CH4. And again, the reason why is that it's nonpolar. And so it will not dissolve in the water. Unfortunately, that ammonia would dissolve in the water, and so again, if it's dissolving in the water, it wouldn't collect in the top of your collection tube. All right, here's another problem. It says, hey, a sample of H2 was collected over water at a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. The atmospheric pressure was found to be 760 millimeters of mercury. If the vapor pressure of water at 25 degrees Celsius is 23.8 millimeters of mercury, determine the pressure of the hydrogen gas. So again, they're giving me atmospheric pressure here. And so if we assume that they moved that tube so that the level of the water was equal both inside and outside of the collection tube, we can assume that this atmospheric pressure is my P total. And then again, this 23.8 millimeters of mercury, as they've stated, this would be my pressure of the water vapor. So if I want my pressure of the H2 gas, I would need to take the total pressure and subtract off the pressure of the water vapor. Now, as long as that these are in the same unit, that subtraction is super easy. If they weren't in the same unit, then you could convert one or the other in order to get the units the same. So once I do my 760 minus my 23.8, that gets a pressure of 736.2 millimeters of mercury. So this would be my pressure of that hydrogen gas that then I could go use in a further calculation. All right, let's say a problem that was actually on the AP test back in 2015. Now this problem actually had some additional components to it, so this was just part of the problem, but it'll give you an idea of the types of problems that they could ask. Um, so you notice here they are giving us that setup of the collection of gas over water. It says that, hey, ethene C2H4 is prepared by the dehydration of ethanol C2H5OH, which is is what we have back over here in our original container. It says we're going to do that using a solid catalyst. A setup for the lab synthesis is shown right here as well as our equation for the reaction that's occurring. And so what's going to happen is that we are making our products here. We're running that through this tube and when we collect up here we are collecting ethene. But don't forget we're also unintentionally collecting a little bit of water vapor. And so we're gonna to have to address that in our problem. So then it says, hey, a student added a 0.2 gram sample of the ethanol to a test tube using the setup shown above. So they are putting that 0.2 grams back over here. And then they're heating the test tube gently until all of it evaporated and the gas generation stopped. When the reaction stopped, 
So the volume of gas collected over here was 0 0.0854 liters at 0 0.822 atmospheres and 305 Kelvin. And then you notice they also give us here the vapor pressure of the water. So they're giving us all that good information there. So then it says, hey, calculate the number of moles of C2H4. So again, that's the ethene that are actually produced in the experiment and measured in the gas collection tube. So let's think about the data we have for what we collected. If I look back up here, I notice that we have a volume, we have a pressure, we have a temperature, and then we also have a pressure of water vapor. They're asking us about calculating a number of moles, which means I'm trying to find an N. And if I start looking at all those pieces, hopefully we see that this is looking a lot like we would be doing some sort of Pivner calculation, which we are. However, here is the one issue. This pressure of the collected gas is technically both the water vapor as well as our gas that we are trying to measure. And so before we use it, we're going to have to subtract off the water vapor pressure. Now you notice that unfortunately these two guys are in two different units, which is a problem. Now you could put them both into atmospheres or you could put them both into tours. I'm going to put them both into tours, but I will tell you this, if you actually look up the original scoring guidelines for this question online, you'll see on the scoring guidelines, they actually converted both into atmospheres. Um, they gave credit converting it either way, as long as you did that conversion to make the units match. So I'm going to take the point 822 atmospheres and I'm going to do a quick conversion to get that into tour. 1 ATM is equal to 760 TOR. And that gets a value of 624.72 TOR. Now, I'm not going to round yet because I know I'm going to be doing some additional math to this. Um, on these kinds of problems, I tend to make that final sig fig determination at the very end. I tend to use my full numbers as I'm working through here. So what I would need to do now is understanding that this is the total pressure if I want just the pressure of the C2H4, I'm going to have to take that 624.72 and subtract off the water vapor, which was 35.7. So again, I'm subtracting TOR from TOR there, which is why I made those match. And so that gets me a final pressure of 589.02 TOR. So this is what I would want to use in my Pivnert setup. So now that I have all of my pieces to Pivnert, now I can actually plug into my equation. So my pressure, as we figured out here, was 589.02 torr. My volume was 0 0.0854 liters. My N is what we're looking for. That's my number of moles. Now my R value I am going to have to get from my formula chart. I would want an R value that matches my pressure unit. So I'm going to use the 62.36. Now keep in mind, if you had converted both of your units into atmospheres, then you would be using the 0 0.08206. And that would be totally fine. You just, again, want to make sure that that R matches up with your pressure unit. So I'm going to, again, use the 62. 0.36 and that's liters times tor over moles times kelvin and then i'm going to have my temperature of 305 kelvin luckily for us tor is matched up because we picked that kelvin matched up i didn't even have to convert from celsius which is awesome liters matched up and so that means my answer should come out in moles. Um, so to solve this math here what I would want to do is my 589.02 times my 0 0.0854 divided by the 62.36 divided by the 305 and that gets a value and I'm going to use three sig figs since all of my original numbers had three significant figures. That gets a value for n of 0 0.00264 moles. And again, that was for the C2H4. So this is how much I 
actually collected of the C2H4. You notice I didn't do anything different on this problem as far as the pivnert was concerned. The only new piece that we've done here is that subtracting off the water vapor before I plugged it in. If you forgot to do that step, then you would have come out with an incorrect number of moles here. All right, the next part of the problem asks us to calculate the number of moles of C2H4 that should be produced if the dehydration reaction went to completion. So obviously this is how much we collected, but keep in mind, I originally reacted two grams of C2H5OH. And so starting with that, this is not necessarily how much C2H4 I should have made. That just happens to be how much I actually collected. So what I'm going to do here is a quick stoichiometry to figure out how much I should have made. Conveniently, if I look back up here, they did give me my molar mass of the C2H5OH. So I'm going to utilize that to get into moles. So I had 46.1 grams for one mole of the c 2 H5OH, and then I would want to do a mole to mole ratio utilizing my balanced reaction. Conveniently, they did give that to us, and we can see here it's a one to one ratio. So I can come over here and say, hey, for every one mole of C2H5OH, I should be making one mole of C2H4. And after doing that calculation, I would have 0.2 divided by 46.1, and then the 1 over 1 doesn't do anything. So that gets me a value here of 0 0.00434. Again, I'm rounding for three significant figures because my original number had three significant figures. And this was my mole of C2H4 that I should have been able to make. Um, Obviously, I didn't make that much, so there should be some sort of error in the lab. So it asked me to calculate a percent yield of C2H4 in the experiment. This is where I would do my experimental, the 264 number, over my theoretical, which we got from my stoic. This is how much I should have been able to make if everything went perfectly. And then I times that by 100 to get it into a percent. So 0 0.00264 divided by 0 0.00434 times 100 gets us 60.8%. So that means I made 60.8% of what I should have been able to make. Last but not least down here, it says, hey, in the experiment, ethanol was evaporated from a liquid to a gas, and then it was decomposed. Then the reaction took place into ethene gas. It says, why could the ethanol gas not be collected via water displacement in the same way as ethene gas? Well, look at the ethanol gas. Hopefully, we notice that it has OH on it, which it's not just carbons and hydrogens at that point, and so that would mean that C2... H5OH is a polar gas. However, C2H4, that's just carbons and hydrogens. And as we've talked about previously, that would mean that that gas is nonpolar. And so because the C2H5OH is polar, it cannot be used in water displacement because it will dissolve in the water. So collecting it via water displacement wouldn't really work. All right, hopefully we're feeling good about doing these kinds of calculations. Again, this problem, with the exception of part D, parts A, B, and C were actually directly from an old AP test. So if you can answer a question like this, then you would be really good with doing a water displacement problem on an actual free response question. All right, if you have any questions or need any help, please feel free to email me. Bye, guys.